Welcome to the Seriously Podcast. I'm your host, Annalise Gann. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the Seriously Podcast, where we make light of serious conversations with really interesting people. Luann Ward is one of Australia's most renowned matchmakers. She's also a dating and relationship coach, podcast host and writer. With over 27 years of experience blending IQ, EQ and physical attraction, Luann helps singles find love offline. Her success has led to many features on The Project, Channel 7, Channel 9, The West Australian, Mary Claire and so much more. But I wanted to get Luann on the show to talk about what qualities we should all be looking for in potential partners and what it's like working in the dating industry. I hope you enjoy this chat with Luann Ward. Here she is. Welcome back to the Seriously Podcast. I'm your host, Annalise Gann, and this week we have Luann Ward. Hi, Annalise. Thank you so much for coming in. It's actually a pleasure. Seriously a pleasure. Oh, <laughs> I love the pun. Thank you so much. Now, Luann, you have over 27 years of experience in the industry, which is incredible. Mm. I want to know, is there any trends as to who matches well together? In terms of like, because like, you do IQ, EQ. yeah. I do, yeah, yeah, I've done a lot in human behaviour and a lot in the brain science of love, of how people fall in love, the difference between how a man falls in love and a woman falls in love. We've got different brain systems. So it's it's really fascinating when you actually start looking at the um, biology of attraction and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the most important thing is understanding complementary similarities and complementary opposites. Understanding what a client's voids are because we all want to have the greatest fulfilment in, in life and the greatest fulfilment in a relationship. So you have to know what someone's voids are. Mm-hmm. And if if I don't know what their voids are, I can't find someone that's got the potential to fill their voids because we all have different strengths in different areas. Some of our strengths are in masculine areas and some of them are in feminine areas. And if you think about a lot of women these days I mean we live in a very androgynous society we we, we, you know masculine feminine blend together and there's a lot of women in very powerful masculine energy and that you know that's beautiful but what happens is unless they know how to slip into their feminine they keep attracting weak men Mm. and they go oh my god it's just so frustrating you know at first everything seems good but if you're really strong you can't have two really strong people Because someone will have to subordinate to the other person. Eventually, one person has to overshadow for the for the relationship to work. And a a strong woman doesn't want to be told kind of what to do by a man. So it's really Mm. about understanding what energy you're in, what you actually want from a man. Because you've got to be able to push him into his masculine if you want him to step up and be. That is so interesting and thank you for saying that because I feel like now in especially in Western society, women have come into powers of position because there's more equality now, which is great. But on the flip end of that is we do have to be more in our masculine to make money and to go to work and to buy a house and etc. if we want to be independent. And that's interesting that you say that because I almost feel like I attract feminine men because I have to be masculine to like pay my bills it's hard so it's like how do people get back into their feminine to know to know what the difference actually is and to be conscious of it and to be Mm. able to say okay you've got your how would I explain it that might make it easy let's say you've got different personas so you've got your queen persona Mm -hmm. you know no one's messing with your queen you know like your uh, Xena and and she's powerful and she's got to support herself and she can't rely on I'm going to get rescued one day. So she's working and doing it for herself. And she's running that part of her life. So she belongs there. But when it comes to romance, she needs to know how to fit into goddess energy. Oh, what's goddess energy? Okay, so goddess energy is receiving. Wow, I love okay. that. So it's sitting back and it's being in flow with your feminine self. It's understanding what do I need to do to reconnect back to, to Mother Nature, to, to, to my goddess energy, and that's doing things because it's, a, it's like a personality trait that you, you, you can have and everybody 
everybody can go there, but to understand what is feminine. Mm. Feminine is receiving. So a man might say, hey, um, oh, I'll get that for you. And you'll be like, no, 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 I, I've got that. It's like, uh-uh. You let him do as much for you as possible and you ask for what you want. Hey, could you fill my glass up? Could you fix my light glow? That's not because you can't. It's because you need that. You need to receive and he needs to give and you need to be able to step back. So your goddess energy belongs in your um, in that relationship sector and then your inner child, your playfulness. She's got to come in there as well and she's got to be there in the dating in the dating game as well because you've got to have fun. But you don't want her running your finances. You know what I mean? You don't want your inner child running True. your finances because she's going to buy really dumb shit. And <laughs> what's your we money? all do that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. That's incredible and I, I love hearing about it as well. For all the single people listening who are going out on dates and have never been having any luck lately, what would, what would be your top tips and advice like with the dating pool okay we, in 2024 we've got to get better at it okay okay people are not very good at dating they think they are okay yep but they they're not really present on the date what happens is we're going out on a date and we are now not excited about the date okay used to be we would go on a date and we'd think, oh, I'm really excited, I'm going out with this guy and did it. And we'll try to look for all the good things about him to see whether he's the right match for us. Now we don't. We go out on a date and we're trying to find all the things we don't like about them. We're Google stalking them, Facebook stalking them. You know, we are trying to find everything before we even go to the date to find out any red flags. So we're on high alert, which is what happens because we're – you know, we're prone to survival, so we are going to go into the flight or fight kind of brain systems. But we're looking for everything we don't like. Mm. So Interesting. That is so true. It is. <laughs> wow. I never even thought of that. So almost being like an eternal optimist would yeah. help, would yeah. be helpful. We are trying to – yeah, look, I think that – We've got to understand that, that that is how we do things. Mm. So how do we change something that's not working? Mm. We've got to change, you know, sort of what we're doing. And these coffee dates, I've been preaching on about this for so long. Never, ever, ever, ever go on a coffee date. If a man wants to take you on a coffee date, he's stingy, he's... No, I just... It's a no. Really? It's a N-O. Excuse me. I love me. that. Look how beautiful you are. How long does that – you're going to go on a coffee date just straight out of your jammies? Absolutely not. No. I, I don't go on coffee dates. Yeah, I'm pretty – I only go on dinner dates. Yes. And if they have to ask me, like I never initiate. I do – I reply, obviously. That's why we go on the date. But <laughs> since I've been dating, like unless you ask me out to dinner or lunch, I'm not going. Yeah, and, and yeah. I think that that's a – And people think I'm like – they're your boundaries and, yeah. and that's actually going into feminine energy. That's oh, actually that's saying... that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. But look, if you say to a man, he says, where do you want to go? I don't mind a man asking that question mm -hmm. because it shows that he actually cares about getting it right. I like that too, yeah. Okay, so you don't have to say, hey, I want to go here. Mm -hmm. You can say, mm, well, I love seafood oh, and I have a real soft spot for great cocktails mm -hmm. but I hate really loud places. Now, you've given him enough information for him to be able to go out and plan a date and you know because you've given him information whether he's actually listened to what you've said mm -hmm. and taken that on board. So I think that's important. Two dates is essential. You should never... Really? Yeah, essential. So more than... So two minimum. Okay. All right. L let's put it this way. If you've never met the person before, you've met them on a dating app or someone set you up, it's called an arrangement to meet. Okay, it's not a date yet. It's just an arrangement to meet. So you've had this arrangement mm -hmm. and you've met each other and you've gone, hmm, did I have a nice night? I don't think we need to be saying, is this the person I want to have a relationship with? Mm -hmm. I think we need to be just coming right back to something very simplistic did I have a good time, yes or no? If 
you had a lousy time and you just thought, oh, my God, this is excruciating for whatever reason, then don't do it again. But if you think, actually, I had a nice time. He, he did all the right things. We are looking for instant chemistry and that is probably my biggest red flag, instant chemistry. That will screw you up in a big way. Really? Yeah, and I'll tell you about that and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. So what you want is to have positive dating experiences. And at the moment, people aren't having positive dating experiences. So they go in expecting it to go... Pear-shaped. Pear-shaped. That, mm, no, look, no, he said that he um, wants to have four kids and oh, no, I can never have four kids or, or whatever it might be. We pick up on this one thing and we don't dig underneath the surface. Mm, I love that. Yeah, well, and, and we've got to go further. We've got to say, I, I don't need to know what the future is. I just need to be present, have that date. If it was fun and it was nice, do it again. And I can tell you why I say this, because I've been collecting data for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I'll have two people, they'll give really great feedback about each other. Oh, no, I didn't feel the connection. But what do you expect? It's the first date. Mm -hmm. You don't – and I would say to them, go and have a second date, double check. Mm -hmm. You don't want to throw the – you know, flush the baby with the bathwater. So go and have a second date. And probably about 30% of the people that have given – both given really good feedback but didn't feel that instant pull, after they've gone on the second date, they end up then going on a third, fourth, and they end up together. Mm -hmm. So it's you, – you've got to double check. Okay. What about, because I know the male and female psychology is different in terms of how our brains are wired or how our brains work. What about sex? <laughs> okay. I love sex. I love talking about sex. Because when people say to me, Luanne, what is the most important part of a relationship? Mm -hmm. I will say categorically sex. What? What? I know, right? Really? Okay. Wow. Think about I it. I would never think that. It is the one thing that makes your relationship sacred because it's the one thing that you're doing with that person that you're, well, supposedly not doing with anybody else. So therefore it's the cherry on the top. It is that part of yourself, you are giving your body to somebody. Mm. You are sharing your psyche, your energy, your everything with them when they are part of you in, in that lovemaking. So the sex becomes you know, it bonds us together. Yeah, it differentiates between a friendship and a relationship. A hundred percent. Now, but sex also spills down into intimacy. Mm -hmm. So when a relationship starts going pear-shaped, sex starts dwindling. And this is a, a, a course when we first meet somebody, you know, you're doing it a lot more. But then you get into the flow of what you, you, you both need. And when people start disconnecting, I mean, I've, I've worked with people that haven't had sex with their husband for 10 years before they broke up. It's incredible. So, because it's not just about the sex, it's about the intimacy. And the intimacy is the holding hands, it's the affection, it's the feeling like you can tell your partner everything. It builds trust and that spills down into friendship. So, it's so important that, you know, if people argue, the quickest way to come back together, see what happens is, is a woman will close that for business. Until you have said or done what I need you to say or do to make this thing right, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, you're not getting the cookie. And, mm. But if you actually came together and made love and then discussed the problem, mm. you're going to find that that problem solving becomes a lot easier. And I'm not suggesting that you should use sex to get your own way, but that's <laughs> not a bad idea. <laughs> love that so sex on the first date oh my god please don't do this awesome please look you can be super attracted to a guy he can be super attracted to you he's saying all the right things he's doing all the right things men are men and they're gonna take it on the first date second date third date or third month that if they like you they don't mind waiting for you of course not but they'll, they'll take it when it's on offer and if, uh, you know, I've had women that I've coached with who have said to me, but he told me that, you know, obviously, you know, and they're at date five, so two weeks in. He thinks that I'm not into him because I'm not having sex with him and he says that, you know, if I don't sort of 
have sex with him, obviously it's proof that I don't like him. I'm saying, if he is not prepared to wait for sex, do you think he's going to stay around after he's got it if he doesn't want to stay around before he's got it? You think he's going to stay around after he's got it? Come on. Mm. So, no. It's a no. So, as well as psychologically when it comes to the first, no, first date, no sex rule, is that because men get disinterested? Yes. Straight away? Yes. Okay. Why is that? Okay. We can go back to to caveman days Mm -hmm. and I'll make it really simple by doing that. love it. Okay. So, let's talk about testosterone. Let's talk about how women fall in love. When a woman orgasms, oxytocin gets released in her system. That is the connection chemical. That's the cuddle chemical. That's the bonding chemical. That's not how men fall in love. Mm. The, the, when a man is chasing you, his testosterone is going up. So w- how that relates to caveman days and you think about it. They're br- very brave, those cavemen. They've got to go out with just a, a stick with a little pointy thing on the end and they've got to feel, you know, come back with a wild beast because they've got to feed all the cave people, you know, the cave family. So he goes out and he's got to be, you know, have high testosterone. He's got to be brave. He's got to be doing the, the fight. So he gets the animal and he comes back and everybody eats. He's not going, great, I've just finished my food. Let's get up and go and hunt again. Because his testosterone has now dropped. Mm-hmm. Because he's had his feed. He's got half a beast still in the cave that's going to last for another three days. So he doesn't need to hunt. He needs to man cave to build his testosterone up again. And this is why when successful, powerful men, for example, or actually all men, if they're using a lot of their testosterone, whether they're, you know, manual workers or they come home, they need to go chill. Mm. Women, we want to go, hey, I want to... But if we just understood that he needs to build that testosterone up that he has just used during the day so he needs that time to go down you're going to get a much better man so as soon as he has you know, and he can be really into you and the chemistry can be there and you get along really well and you start sleeping with him two weeks into the relationship you guys don't know each other number one but what happens is sometimes he starts retreating and he doesn't even know why he'll go I don't know, don't know whether she's the right girl for me. That happens a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot. Yeah. And and if we understand that until he's made up his mind that he wants to commit to you, he's th- that, that's how men start falling in love, that they want to commit to you. They're like, wow, I really like this lady. So they want to keep chasing? Yes. What about, interestingly enough, I find this fascinating, when you get in a, a relationship with a man and you're a woman... The chase ends, right, and you become partnered in a relationship. Mm. And a lot of women, myself included, have experienced when the man just suddenly loses interest and he's comfortable. Yeah, okay. What happens there? He's an anti-seducer, all right. And what what happens is that who teaches us about relationships? Who teaches us how to keep a relationship alive? Who? Mm. Yeah, where do we learn that? No one, really. We only go and learn that once the relationship is... Hashtag failed. I don't like to think of a relationship as a failure. But we don't go and look for how do I keep this relationship alive? And you do that by constantly seducing your partner. And I don't mean a, a sexual seduction. It'll end, you know, in a, you know, in a sexual act because it brings you closer together. But it's constantly seducing your partner. It's doing things for them. So once a man gets comfortable and a woman's like, hello, I, I, I'm over here, he's, he's become an anti-seducer. He needs to do things. He needs to do little romantic things. How can you bring that back into the relationship right from the very beginning? You have to teach a man how to treat you. You have to teach him what you need and what you want. And, and part of that is training him. So that is okay to train men. You have to train – you've got to train a man. Yeah, it's interesting, hey, because I think women, because we're so smart, we just assume they should know. Uh, Okay. All right. Here, ladies, here's the the news flash. (laughs) Men have been trained by their mother. (laughs) 
True. Zero to six, our first program goes in, like the Windows version one. Oh, God. Okay. You think about you know, how we used to use computers. We would have, you know, years ago when you bought a computer, you couldn't use it until you put a program in it. Mm. So baby's born, has no program. This first six, seven years of its life, it's getting programmed by what it sees, hears, smells, tastes, touches and experiences. So our parents teach us how to have a relationship. And unless we keep upgrading that, that version, Windows 2, Windows 3, Windows 4, we're stuck in this same program. Men have been trained by their mother. If the mother has done everything for the, for the child mm. and made that child ju juvenilely dependent on my mum does this and my mum does that and he doesn't have to do anything back for his mum, that's what you're going to get in a relationship. You've got to train him how you need him to be. Right. Okay. And, and, and that's, not, that's not saying that would disrespect for men in any way, shape or form. Absolutely not, yeah. M men want to please women. Mm. If the woman's happy, he feels like King Kong. He it, does, yes. yes. If yeah. he's got a woman and she's happy and she's like, oh, my God, I so appreciate that. Thank you. Mm. He feels good. But you've got to understand that the, the, what we do is we spend a lot of time telling men what they're doing wrong. Yeah. And not what they're doing right. Okay. So d do we need to shift that narrative as women? We like, need to shift the, the narrative mm. right from day one. Mm -hmm. So right. how can we reframe the way we – because I think when women communicate, you would know way more than me, but, like, we do say the problem to fix the problem in terms of mm – -hmm. He doesn't see it as a problem, you see. Oh, really? <laughs> He's thinking, why is that a problem? You want to have a problem, you want to see what I had to deal with today. So we have to – as soon as you say the word problem for a man, as soon as you say, look, we need to talk – Oh, he's shut down emotionally immediately. He's not even – he's like, oh, God, here we go again. I remember when I um, – you know, when my kids were, were young and, you know, you're in that mum's mm -hmm. kind of group. And I, I never did the, the whole mother's group thing. So when my kids went to kindy and, you know, preschool and what have you, they started making friends and you start making friends with the mums. And I love to cook. I love to entertain. So we would have these dinner parties from, from hell. And so many of the mums, you know, that I became friends with, they would say to me, how do you get your husband to do so much for you? I mean, like, he does so much. We can't even get our husbands to do this. And, you know, I was working, you know, I'd run my business the whole way through and he w had his business as well. But they're like, he just does things for you. How do you get him to do that? Mm. And that's because I knew in the early days of telling him, what you need, what you want, and then sit back and let him do it. You can't tell a man what to do, you know, ask him to do something and then tell him how to do it. Okay, so if you're going to ask him to do something, you can't then go and tell him how to do it. Okay. It's got to be one or the other. So we've got to relinquish control. Absolutely. Get Step back. Can you please do the grass? Can you please do this? Yeah. But not how to do it. Not how to do it. You can... Ooh. You I can, like that. Yeah, you can make a um, covert, you know, you can make a request, a kind request rather than a covert demand, okay? Mm. And covertly is doing it in a more shy way, but it's a more demanding, it needs to be done this way. Hey, would you be able to cut the carrots into like, you know, sort of one centimetre chunks? Sometimes you look at them doing it and you're thinking, oh, my God, that's just excruciating watching that because, do you know, if you did it this way, it would be so much easier, but you just got to go, oh. Yeah, and then the praise yep, when just, they've cooked. You're like, yep. you're so good at that. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely, and you do that, and the more he feels appreciated, the more he actually wants to do, mm. and the more he takes the initiative to do it. But when we are pointing out everything he's doing wrong, when it comes to you needing him to stand up and have your back, he can't be there for you because he thinks, I can't even cut a carrot right. Mm. Why would I, I'm not even going to have an opinion on this one. And, and that's when you're vulnerable and you need him and he can't be there for you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask in terms of um, masculinity, 
What is the line, and this is probably a very complex and layered question, uh, your answer, what is the line between a strong man in positive masculine energy, where's the line then going into toxic masculinity? Mm. Like where does the line get drawn? Okay, well toxic is toxic whether it's masculine or whether it's feminine. Mm -hmm. Okay, And, and insecurity is allowed. All right, so if a man is insecure, he a lot of times he will become toxic. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he's very loud and he's dominating and he's aggressive and he's, you know, and you, you watch out for those behaviours. But we have to understand what the, the masculine qualities are mm-hmm. of being driven, of being decision-making, problem-solving. If we are not allowing them to be that, they're going to slip into feminine energy or they're going to clash with you and they're going to try to regain their regain their power. Toxic is toxic, okay? And someone that's being bullying, aggressive, speaking down to you, yelling at you, that, that's not masculine. No. It's just toxic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... So they're separate. Yeah, but you want a man to tell you to calm your farm. When you're overreacting to something. Do I though? <laughs> <laughs> I know. But imagine if you have a yes man. Oh, can you oh, do this? I've yes. I've had that. I don't yes. need that again. Yes. You know, you, you want someone that has to Your stand up and say, do you know what? If you want to talk to me, I'm, I'm happy to sit down and have a civil conversation with you. But I'm not going to I'm not going to have you in this emotional state. So you get yourself calm mm-hmm. and then we'll have a proper conversation. Now, that's a masculine response to something that's not a toxic response that's him letting you know he's got healthy boundaries he knows what they are he's going to say you're not an emotional state to talk about this right now so why don't we just both take 15 minutes 10 minutes walk around the block we'll come back together and let's talk about you so you know that he's got your back he's caring about you because if you go down that rabbit hole when you're emotional you can't solve anything what about age gaps? Should women ever date younger or can they? Of course they can. Okay. My husband was 10 years younger than me. Oh, nice. Mm. No, I'm just thinking the emotional maturity. I guess it's dependent on their upbringing and a lot it's of things. It's totally dependent on many things. It's dependent mm. on where you are at in your life. Yeah. It depends on your voids and his voids, what you need filled by him and what he needs filled by you. If you're not filling each other's voids... You're going you're gonna to want someone that's going to fill those voids. So you've got to understand who am I, what voids do I need him to fill? Because he's got to know what his place is and his purpose is and you've got to know also what your place and purpose is. What can I bring to the table? And an age gap, we've seen it in society for a very long time where you will have a powerful, successful man in his midlife crisis, we'll, we'll call it a midlife crisis, in his midlife crisis age from 45 to 60, let's say. And he's been married for a long time. They break up and he goes out and what does he get? A 25-year-old. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And and where, where we've got to understand this is he's got empowerment in the masculine areas of life. So some of the masculine areas of life are financial empowerment, um, career empowerment, now, successful men, what do they like to be? The envy of other men. Because as they start getting older, their testosterone drops. And the, the way to bring that up is to, to be more successful, to be the envy of other men. How do they get to be the envy of other men? By having things that other men don't have. Okay, it's, it's, it's power. And, and the word power is, is not a negative word. Okay, so to have a powerful partner is, you know, I think that can be kind of intoxicating. So what happens is... He's ageing, his testosterone is, is dropping. A young woman, she is in, you know, she's usually physically empowered. In her prime. She's in her prime. She's, you know, her body's in good shape, her skin's in good shape. She is empowered in this area of life. But she's not usually yet empowered in the career and the financial side. Oh, so they're filling each other's voice. Yeah, it's a fair exchange in a relationship. She's bringing youth and beauty. He's bringing, uh, you know, uh, stability and fun. You know, he's got finances to do fun things. They have a fair exchange. 
Wow. Of filling each other's voids. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And you've also got testosterone and estrogen as well mm -hmm. because what brings up a man's testosterone? Estrogen. Does it? Yeah. You know, th you know so th th and the, the desire to want to chase something, mm. again, it, it's primal. Mm. So it is. It's, yeah. it's primal. And it, w we frown upon it in society that that happens, but... It's, it's kind of natural because they're filling each other's void. So that, that's what you're really looking for in a relationship, to know who am I, where does this person fit in my life, what voids do I need them to fill, do I need a fun, do I need a venture, do I need to learn something from a man, do I need mental excitement, is that what's missing from my life? You know, you've got to find your voids first. Amazing. Mm. So many things that I'm learning today. Thank <laughs> you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Luann, if people want to book your services yeah. or contact your team, because mm -hmm. you have a team of beautiful people who yes. work for you, <laughs> um, you're very, very successful, how can they get in contact with you? Okay, so Facebook, Instagram, Google. I really uh, work – Yeah, I don't advertise my services. People will, will yeah. find me, put my name into any one of those – platforms and you you're going to find me i'm putting out some programs very very soon so a 21 day dating reset so it's a it's not a challenge but it's a reset to go okay ha how can i change my how can i change the the focus of what the outcome of my dating life is and so i've got 21 things that people can do to actually press that reset button on their on their love life and it's it's a really fabulous little program. So that's going to be launching very, very soon. Amazing. Mm. And your social media is Luann Ward. Luann Ward. And, yeah, Luann Ward Matchmaking is the matchmaking side of the business. Yeah. You are incredible. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This Thank has been an amazing chat. I could chat to you all day. <laughs> you're so easy to talk to and you're, you're so full of knowledge. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Luann. Thanks, guys, for tuning in this week too seriously. It's been an amazing interview and I'll catch you next week for another guest. Bye.